coming at you live from the ISS Atlantic City show. It's the Q&A with Alan and Marshall show. I'm Alan Powell. No, you're not. I'm, Alan Powell. <laughs> I'm Marshall Atkinson, and welcome to our show. And uh, we have a huge classroom, and we've got three people in it. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody's got questions. I know that you guys are tuning in, and you're going to have a lot to say and comment on also. So uh, just make sure that we sound good. We've got our, all of our new equipment set up. Yep. And uh, we're happy to be here. So thanks a lot. And we got, here's another guy walking in right yeah. now. All right, I'll be fine to see you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, thank you for joining us. And what we'd like to do right now is uh, just make sure that uh, you help us out by sharing that you're watching the show. So if you could just click share and share that you're watching it on YouTube or Facebook or Twitter or whatever you're watching on. Let everybody know that you're watching it, and we would really appreciate that. So uh, anyway, so Alan, uh, we've been here a couple of days. What do you think so far of the show? You've been here a couple of days. I got in yesterday afternoon. Uh, you know what? It is always good to be back at shows, seeing people. That's the first thing. Right. You know, Marshall, we were all talking about. There are some people. I just saw Dane Clement. I don't think I've seen him in two years. Right. Uh, in the Speaker's Lounge. Uh, so for us, it's getting to see people, clients customers, mm -hmm. business associates. And, you know, as much as we, we say this, that this is an industry, we're all here to make a profit. We're all here to do stuff. This is a community too. And, you know, after 35 years, these are people that are friends that are family. And, you know, you really appreciate during COVID, you know, when we're keeping in touch with each other, but we do miss seeing each other. We've called, like when you do shows like that, Marshall, I don't know if people know, when we start speaking like this, it has been called by Aaron Montgomery. It's kind of like the carnival circuit. And we all just see each other going to the shows and stuff. Right. But we do miss it. So it's good to see everybody. That's the best part. Uh, some new things we're going to talk about at the show, too. I saw some great new products. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, lots of good stuff. Yeah, so this is a Q&A show. So we want to remind everybody watching right now to please drop us a comment. Leave us a, uh, mm -hmm. a question. This is Q&A. So it isn't just uh, Marshall and Alan make stuff up. It's uh, We need your questions to make the show work. So we got some folks watching. So let's say hey to some folks. So uh, Dan Solomon's watching from Wales. So good to see you, Dan. Kingdom. Thank you so much for helping us out with the Silicone Inc. Uh, broadcast that we did last week. So that was really good. What a great episode that was. Yeah. And uh, Dave Eber Eggers is watching. Good morning. Looks empty. Yeah. Well, we just got started and it's nine o'clock in the morning. Right. And I know quite a number of people were out on the town last night boozing it up because I was out there with them. So uh, I won't mention any names. We won't like, mention oh, any names. Oh, wait. No. <laughs> and uh, get some people in there. I think probably some people will show up here in a minute. Yep. And then James Ortolani is here watching. So hi, uh, Marshall and Alan watching from Ringo from Kansas. No, with Ringo. That's his dog. If you've never uh, go on James's uh, Facebook page and he has a dog, Ringo, and a uh, – uh, a cat and they chase each other. It's hilarious watching him play. So, right. yeah. And then uh, Mark uh, is watching from GSG. Good morning, uh, guys. Watching from Texas. From GSG, our sponsor, who we're so glad to have. So, let's do this. Why don't we uh, run the commercial real quick? Yep. And then pay some bills and we'll come back. I know Davis is really antsy about ans asking a question. Yep. So, go ahead, Mark. Are you running the controls or am I? I'll do it. I'll drive today. Where is the thing? Right. Uh... All right. Hey, we're back. So uh, hope you guys enjoyed that commercial. And uh, so Lyra is watching from the Philippines. So appreciate you, Lyra, and everything that you do. So appreciate that. So uh, we have our first question asker. And so I, although I know who you are, why don't you just introduce yourself and where's your shop and then uh, lay, lay the question on us. Thank you, guys. Uh, Davis Slagle from B Graphics, just south of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And 
Uh, my question to you is what are some of the top products of, I, I would say in two categories, one would be printing equipment and then the other one would be a printable. What are some of the new, uh, best things you saw so far at the show this year? So far at the show. So uh, Alan and I were actually talking about this at breakfast this morning. Thanks, Davis. And uh, one of the things that we actually has a topic was uh, MNR has a new press, the Rival, which is a European style press with the heads that come down. And actually, uh, I really like the fact that it had a, a pin that removes the squeegee. I thought that was really kind of interesting for a quick change. It's only 12 and a half feet wide. So if you're a smaller shop and you want to put in an auto, that's that's pretty good for a diameter, right? So it, it is. And I think this might be, and correct me if someone, if I'm wrong, this might be the first press that MR makes where it is a head moves up and down, the heads move up and down as opposed to the pallets. Um, mm -hmm. To me, it seems, I, I like that because it seems to be lighter on that, but I'm not an engineer. That's an Alan Howe opinion for whatever that's worth. Uh, I do like the squeegee setup too, Marshall. Yeah. But also too, they use that pivot cylinder a lot of times on some of the European presses. And what I like what MNR did is on the cylinders, instead of one that connects the pressure, they've actually made it with both of them on each side. So it seems like you have a little bit more control over the pressure and, um, and flood bar. Now it is brand new. Uh, when I was getting the run through on it, uh, yesterday, it's not going to be out to May. There's some changes they're going to make. Looks like they have a tri lock system coming for it. So that well, they was told the, me it was tri lock compatible. I was talking with one of the guys yesterday. With Jimmy, yeah. So Jimmy said it's there. They have it. They just did some things. Um, you know, as the heads now move up and down, you have to have a space for that block to go. And so they've had to go to a little bit have, uh, heavier uh, throw. I think they call it going up and down. And you, if you can't see this, this means throw. Right here on my hand. That's a universal yeah. signal. Um, and, and when uh, you do that, you freeze up. So don't do that. I anymore. won't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so yeah, so they are getting it. You know, they are tweaking it because they like things compatible uh, with the rest of their system. So I thought that was the that was the newest thing I saw yesterday. Um, mm -hmm. uh, DTF is still a lot. That is still kind of all the rage coming through. And, uh, and, and that's Davis's favorite thing. It is that. And, you know, Davis, <laughs> we were talking about you at breakfast, too, not just about the tequilas that you threw back, um, which did come up. But, um, you know, you have pushed all your chips in on DTF uh, as an early adopter. Um, and that is awesome because you know you're going to be the guinea pig, but you're going, I'm going to master this better than everybody. And most of these things are made overseas. You know that. And, man, Kudos to you uh, for going all into on that. Just going, this is going to be it. We're going to live or die by this. Mm -hmm. And right now you're living on it. And so that was awesome at dinner talking last night about your business has changed and what you're doing to formulate for that. So that's still a big one. I think it's still the emphasis of uh, DTF, uh, direct uh, transfer film. And I think there's just more stuff to come because I know there's more stuff done overseas excuse me, that hasn't come to this country yet. So, Marshall, anything you want to add on that? Uh, well, a lot of the stuff that I saw is, you know, the, the some of the same things that you see at other shows. So, um, but to be honest, I didn't really get in and investigate. <laughs> so uh, yeah. I taught a class and I did a lot of networking stuff and I wasn't actually really looking at, hey, there's a new whatever, right? That wasn't that wasn't my purpose mm -hmm. yesterday. So uh, I, uh, sorry. <laughs> so you're going to have to go down Useless, you, yeah. and research yourself. Right? I failed you. <laughs> right. Um, so Josh is watching from Oklahoma. Good, good morning. Dan Solomon says, I know there's some, uh, been some work through the pandemic on greener inks. I see virus has a new black. Any of those hitting the show? Uh, I didn't see any virus. And I know that. It's probably because they, I don't even think they have a U.S. distributor anymore. Am, yeah, am the, I uh, wrong on that? Yeah, last I heard, Virus is still selling direct to the, some of their accounts here in the States. But uh, I saw they had a new blackout. I saw it on social media, but I have not seen it here to show or any uh, mm -hmm. word from Virus on it. Yeah. Did you have other questions? Um, no, yeah. <laughs> Please rush the mic. 
<laughs> All right. And you have to introduce I have yourself. A, I have a few. Okay, okay. introduce yourself and then ask your question. Okay, hello. And sing us and sing a song. Oh, you don't want that. <laughs> I, know, I was earlier about that. Sorry. Hi, I'm Victoria Lyons. I'm uh, the owner of The Lyons Techmatic Incorporated. And my question is, I, I just recently started uh, DTF. I've been doing sublimation for almost two years. I've been doing DTF for almost a year. Mm -hmm. um, what, uh, I'll say, if a person wanted to get into this business, what advice would you give them? And also, I'm looking to get into embroidery. So yeah. is there any companies I should look at that yeah. will help out? Because I took a digitizing class. And yeah. Nah. Well, so <laughs> I, would, I would recommend first, you write a business plan. Yep. Right. Uh -huh. Everybody has ever met me knows that that's my first answer for everything. It's all about sales. It's not about your production. The production will always follow. But if you have no sales, it doesn't matter what your production is, whether you have it in house or what you have to learn to sell. Right. And your uh, business plan is going to help you focus on who your best customer is. So a business plan is a bullseye that you're going to direct your, your whole business to. And and so, uh, so some questions you want to ask is, who are they? What do they buy? What is their problem that you're uniquely qualified to solve? What's going to make you different? Because I can tell you that whatever customer you have, they already have somebody doing their shirts. Okay. So why are they going to fire them and hire you? And if you don't have an answer for that, you're dead in the water before you get started. So you have to answer that with your business plan. What's going to make you better? You've got better turn times. You've got uh, better artwork. You've got something uh, online stores. You've got something that's going on that's really going to make you stickier than the next person. So are okay. you saying do a business plan for each? So if you is so I've I've had I have a business plan for um, one aspect of my business. Yeah. Are you suggesting do a business plan for each? Thing? Well, modify I, your current I, business plan. Yeah, I would do like, uh, you know, if you're going to, let's just say, I don't know what you do, but let's just say you're going to do hospitals, schools, and uh, yesterday in my class, we talked about uh, German Shepherds, right, yeah. on websites, right? Mm -hmm. So you could do a business plan for each one of those because, you know, the <coughs> hospital is going to order different stuff than like a German Shepherd pet owner would, right? So what are they interested in? What are those problems? How are you going to solve them? What apparel? What's the decoration? When do they order? You know, all that stuff might be different. So that's why you want to hone that in on, on, with a business plan. Now, when it, let's say you did that part, mm -hmm. right? And then now you want to do the decoration. So before you spend lots of money on equipment, I would find people who can do the outsource production for you, right? And then every time you order, a chunk of that money, okay, from that order goes into a war chest, and then when you have enough money, you can just stroke a check for the equipment that you want. Because now you've learned to sell it, you learn how to do it, you learn to talk to customers, and you kind of have been talking with people in the industry and you can find out what is the best piece of equipment and what do you gotta do and what do you need and where's my space gonna be for production and all that kind of stuff. You can be working on that as you grow your business. A lot of people buy the toys first mm -hmm. and then they figure try to figure out how to sell it which is always a mistake, which is why, frankly, there's a lot of used equipment on the market because mm -hmm. nobody knows how to sell. They might know how to print or how to embroider, but they don't know how to sell. And now we have no money and we miss our equipment payment. I got to get rid of the stuff. Right. So I would I would do the selling part first and get that work working and then find people in your area or people you can outsource to that can handle the stuff for you. And like if you're just going to do DTF, you know, just order from Supercolor. Or from stalls, there's a lot of people that do that kind of stuff, and uh, they're happily will do uh, that part of the production for you, and then you can just do the heat press part yourself, right? Exactly. So don't worry about making the transfers at first, and then later on, you can, uh, as the market for DTF matures, you can be looking at some equipment that'll make sense for you. So I have the equipment. Um, the equipment has paid for itself already. Good. Um, the embroidery equipment? The, no, no, no. The DTF. Equipment. Okay, good, good. So, um, what do you have? Uh, the 3800. It's a it's a 24 inch. Um, okay. Um, Which man? Um, McLeod. Epson. It's Epson, but it's from McLeod. McLeod. Um, okay, good. Technology. So it's a wonderful uh, printer. Good. So it's, it paid for itself already. So I'm 
very happy with the DTF system, even though it's just starting out. Yeah. But now I'm finding a lot of uh, my clients now, because of the business plan, <laughs> yep. uh, a lot of the clients now are looking into embroidery. Right. Uh, because they love how that stitch and how it's yep. coming up. And yeah. So that nature. So it's a whole get. different market. Well, let me, let me tell yeah. you. So right behind you is Davis, right? And he outsources his embroidery. And he also outsources embroidery patches yes, on his cool. Instagram. He shared this white hat with a puff embroidery was a Gothic D like Detroit tiger looking D right. It was a, it was a, a, a patch he used a heat press with. Yes. He didn't sew it on. It looks fantastic. And that's why I love coming to this because I, I was able to, I was looking for people that you outsource to. So everyone right. always saying outsource, 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 but it was like, you ask somebody, hey, what, do you outsource? <laughs> and they were like, no. <laughs> so it was hard to find that. So it's what? good that I came here so I can right. meet people that you can. One, one other thing, too. So this is great. Like you said, get the work just going. Start outsourcing. Have your customer base set up. But then if you decide you do want to bring it in-house, this is where you start learning going. Do your research on machines and then start getting training on them. And I know our sponsor, GSG, actually has, if you go to uh, gogsg.com, they actually have around the country, I know they have some introductory into embroidery classes okay. that are mm -hmm. done. And I would suggest taking those, whether anybody goes into something, screen printing, DTF, whatever, before you take that money and put it into equipment, go get trained on it. Because that way you go, oh, this is what I thought it is. It fits into my plan. I can do it. Or, boy, I'm glad I took this and spent only a little bit of money and I'm not going to invest in it. It's better that way. Mm -hmm. So do that. Get the training when you can. I know GSG is the first ones that come to mind on their embroidery classes. Liz Beaver is amazing who does it. They're embroidery specialists. So yeah, wherever... I took an embroidery class and, and we started off with digitizing. And that's mm -hmm. what I knew. I, uh, no. I well, and you can that. always, there are places that you can have digitizing done. So that's not a also as a business owner right there's only so much you can do yeah right it, it's really great to get other people doing the things for you so you can concentrate on how you can serve your customers and your business the best um you know so uh a thing that i advise people uh, on is just think about how much your time is worth an hour right exactly. so let's say your time is worth 50 dollars an hour okay mm -hmm. Can you find somebody to digitize anything for less than $50 an hour? Probably. Okay. So why would you spend the time doing it? Okay. I would rather you spend your time finding new clients and finding new opportunities and keeping your head up and looking for that than really get mired into the, the, the minutia of running your apparel decoration business. Okay. Does that help? Yes. Awesome. So I have more questions. Did you I'm gonna give it up to other Well we're we're here for an hour. You can come back. <laughs> good. So let's say hi to some folks. Yep. So Hurley's watching from Canada. So uh, good morning. Hey Hurley. Yeah. And he's very early there. It's, I right. don't know what time it is there. I think he's central time. What time is in Saskatchewan? Anybody know? It's yeah. probably uh like six fifteen in the morning, maybe. Yeah, I would think so. Ron Goodwin's watching. Good morning. From Massachusetts, Ron, it's always a good day. Uh, James says, similar to the DTF look back in the 70s and 80s was litho transfer. Yep. Yep. Uh, Ron says, nothing happens without a sale. Good point, Marshall. Yep. Thanks. I love it when people agree with me. <laughs> I love when Ron always says good. It's always in capital letters. Yeah. yeah. That's then, good, uh, man. Yeah, always a good day with Ron. And then Frank, uh, good from SNS Activer is watching. So good morning, Frank. And he says, good morning, Marshall. Now in how is Atlantic City? It's rainy and misty and nasty. Just yes. like it always is for the Atlantic City. In Atlantic City when we're here all the time. The weather's but, always awful. Yeah, the, the joke always, I think, is that welcome to sunny Atlantic City. It's yes. Never, it's never sunny. <laughs> all right. Well, cool. So uh, any anybody else here? You guys have a question? Come on up to the mic and introduce yourself and, and uh, bring it. But Frank, the show so far, the little bit I've seen yesterday has been good, and we've talked about that a little bit. So, all right. Nice so, introduce yourself. Where you're from? Sure. All that. Well, good morning. My name is Sam Wright. Uh, to go with my sister Julia, we own Tri-State Printing in Hagerstown, Maryland. Uh, Tri-State is a traditional commercial printer, uh, newsletters, envelopes, business cards, and uh, um, we just celebrated our 50th year. Uh, Great. Thank you. 
You don't years. look that old. <laughs> yeah, it's been. <laughs> it's <true. laughs> so you started, started when you were like yes. four. I'm yeah, actually an 85 year old man trapped in a 45 year old <laughs> yeah. body. So, <laughs> uh, boy. But uh, I'll tell you, we uh, about four years ago, we got into screen printing and embroidery. We bought some manual equipment, some used uh, embroidery from uh, a little shop in town. And we recently expanded last year. We had a rather large expansion uh, with an acquisition that had automatic presses and a nice little book of business. Nice. So we know how to print. We know how to organize traditional print production jobs. I tell you, we are struggling with how to automate orders that come through through both the screen printing and embroidery. The shop that uh, does this work still uses NCR forms. Um, Ooh, we're free park carbon forms. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <sighs> so I, I mean, we have a call. Now. They want their <laughs> technology back. Yeah. So, well, there's a problem because in my business, you on the print side, you can enter an order on the website. It goes directly to yep. your output device. The MIS system automatically invoices. It falls into QuickBooks, and I mean we process an order in no time flat. But we are struggling because my MIS system for my print side doesn't. But that's some manipulation work on MI, uh, with these orders. We did uh, work with Inksoft for a while. Uh, we found their storefront to be quite nice, but we couldn't quite get the automation we were looking for right. into our accounting system. So. I don't know. What, I think you get yeah. the picture of where I am. Right. What so about, what do you know use a uh, print software for your main printing business now? What is that? Uh, Presswise. Uh, and we, you can't make that work for the apparel side? We just started uh, working with that here over the past month. We switched back and we're converting orders into. Because what I would do is I would try to make it work so you only have one system. Yeah. Right. So. Can you like uh, change the, the SKU or the thing? Or, you know, I don't. I don't know that yeah. software, but I would try to make that work first. Okay. Even if you have to hire a nerd yep. to help you do that, because okay. it could be um, uh, very beneficial for you instead of somebody having to learn two systems. Sure. You're still on one system, mm -hmm. right? So if most of your other businesses on that one platform. If you can get it to work for the apparel into things, that's going to be better for you long in the long run than trying to do something with the our industry software, mm -hmm. which is, there's tons of them. They're, they all work great. Right. Yeah. So uh, I would try to work on that. Okay. Right. Uh, have you done any momentum uh, workflow stuff with that at all? Well, as I said, we about a month or so ago, we did switch back to our press wise system and, yeah. and we do have another friend in the industry who uses a similar software. And so we kind of gave us some templates to help yeah. build these orders, but it's just not, yeah, that software is designed for print automation, uh, business cards, letterheads, yeah. envelopes, uh, and it's all in a, you know, an Excel sheet that builds those. Um, so the thing I like about that system is it allows the artwork to pass through with the job. It allows a whole lot of automatic proofs to go back to customers. So we don't right. have as many touches with yeah. people in the front. It right. just seems like we're touching stuff an awful lot. And I'm not used right. to that. Yeah. <laughs> right. <So. laughs> well, I would, I would see, you know, start small, oh, just yeah. something something easy okay right? and just just try to see if you can make it work and if you can't that's okay yeah. and now you know what to do i would put some uh dedicated effort yeah. behind that and it sounds uh, like there's some good training out there at least on the embroidery um oh yeah is there an association or a club or something that i need to be you, looking at uh, on the board here is okay. uh shirt lab tribe you okay. should join that all right and uh that's uh that's my group. <laughs> that's so that's a ma okay. mastermind group. Dave, oh, Davis great. right there behind him. Okay. He's in that. And yeah, uh, we we have a uh, it's a it's a, a community of apparel decorators that talk about uh, problem solving and nice. what works and all that kind of stuff. And uh, it's a community that's all about helping each other. Right? Perfect. So, so I assume that's like in our print side, we have print owners groups. We get together a couple times a year. I assume that's what this is on the. Yeah, yeah. So we have live events. We're having one in Chicago on July the twenty second, right. right. and uh, we have a virtual event coming up soon called Shirt Lab Summit, okay. uh, which is a free interview style thing. In fact, Davis is one of our speakers on that. All right. And uh, so it's uh, lots of fun, and I think you would enjoy that. Wonderful. There's also recorded content from other seminars and stuff, right. and other speakers okay. and stuff. Yeah. And so well, I think this is what we're looking for. <laughs> it, and you know what? There's a lot of of course, in this industry, a lot of Facebook groups, a lot of things like that. And one of the reasons they started Shirt Lab Tribe, and I've just been one of the speakers there, so I don't have any skin in the game on it, but it is people that actually care about their business. It's not an opinion. Uh, Marshall and Tom, who own it, 
watch that going, okay, who are we going to have speaking? Who are we going to have educating? And make sure it's not an opinion. Because if you go to a Facebook group and say, I have this, you're going to get a thousand opinions. Some may be right. Some may be partially right. And yeah, a lot of us have been in the industry just go, we stopped responding. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's got a, have you ever been on some of those, David, some of those Facebook groups? It gets pretty ugly. And so yeah. um, Shirley I've Tribe has been a breath of fresh air because it is companies helping companies, people helping people. And yeah, it's been a nice community. Hmm. Well, that's it for now. I'm sure I'll well, come. Well, thanks, Sam. Right. Nice. Thanks for coming, Sam. <laughs> thanks awesome. for having us. Right. Uh, so we have a question yep. from the viewer. So Dan Solomon asks, how is shirt supply these days getting any better? So let's ask the guys here. So what do you guys think? Are you finding the shirts that you need? Is uh, Well, how's the inventory for y'all? For y'all? So I can say, I feel that basics are much easier to get your hands on at the moment. Um, if you are trying to buy a baseball jersey since the consolidation of Founder Sport Group and Augusta's consolidation with Pacific, good luck. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, that, that is- Plus the, it's that time of year and everybody's that, doing yeah. so. It's that so. time of year there's less entire vendors of, right. since they're consolidating them down. I know there's mm -hmm. more on closeout that there is actually more in new products. So mm -hmm. I understand what they're doing. It just is putting, uh, they're putting the retailers in a tough spot because you don't have six companies to go to anymore. You have two now. Right. So uh, that, that that's tightened down the industry. Outerwear is bare pickings in most cases left from the end of the winter season, but that's to be expected. But uh, for the most part, this, they seem, it seems to be on an upward trend. Mm -hmm. And the one thing you still can't buy anywhere is headwear. Right. Yeah. Headwear is yeah. so unbelievably I, I bad. I saw online that uh, Sanmar got uh, like 40,000 Richardson hats. Or I don't know what the WSS. number was. And they sold out yeah. in four hours. Yeah. Right. I mean, I don't know what the quantity was. It was some huge allotment and four hours they were already gone so i spoke with the girl from FlexFit yesterday and her statement to me was if you want any of these hats buy them eight months out and wait for them to come because when they show up in eight months they're practically all sold right and they're filling orders that have already been placed we can't we yeah. cannot sell you an order once it shows up because it's been pre-sold yeah that's that's what so if anybody is doing large volume in hats to right. pre-buy them well, I also was uh, speaking with somebody and they have gone and they're sourcing their own hats and making them. Oh. <clears throat> and so it's all about how you solve the problem. Of course, these are major players that can do that, right? So that's if you're a smaller shop, you're not going to order 20,000 hats, but these people do. And so they just, they're just making their own hats now. So Funny you say that. I've actually looked at sourcing smaller quantities down to 200 pieces direct yeah. with factories. Mm -hmm. And if you look in the right places, you actually can find that too. Yeah. Uh, and it, it does help uh, if you have six to eight weeks on it. Right. So if they're not in a super hurry and they know they're not going to get it for six to eight months. Yeah. Six to eight weeks doesn't sound so bad. Six right. to eight yeah. weeks like yesterday. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Yeah. Right. So, um, but yeah, that's, that, that's probably my views on it right now. And oh, yeah. that's what I got. Great. Thanks, Thanks Davis. Thank you. Awesome. I'm kind of seeing the same thing out there that David said out in the field. I'm seeing some things opening up, uh, you know, have kind of calmed down a little bit, but then there's still those bottlenecks. And I think as product comes in, it's unloaded and out there that we feel a little bit of relief, but yeah, there's still an issue and who knows, you know, in two weeks, basics might be a tough one. <laughs> well, I, I just think, it, you know, there's so many variables to this. It's the time of year. It's the item. It's the, you know, uh, some big programs, you know, where there's a big uh, team or run or whatever on a certain color, that's somebody comes in and just buys everything up. Uh, you know, back right. when I was running shops, we would do that because we'd had some clients that, you know, their color for their event is purple. We would buy, you know, 200,000 purple shirts, which is basically all the purple there that, that are yeah. out there, right? So, um, just one of those things you got to just get in there. So it's not going to be Gonzaga. That's yeah. Well, Gonzaga lost yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of it. 
I, I forgot to look to see where we are on that, but uh, I know uh, Bray, Braden's not happy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we were talking. Do we need to call Braden Jensen from out there in Washington? <laughs> Check on his well being. Yeah, pull him off the ledge. Braden, it's okay, man. <laughs> right. Um, Michigan lost to Quant. Mike Shoseski has one more game. So. Still good. <laughs> okay. So. Right. Right. All right. Well, cool. So, uh, no more questions from the gallery here. Do you guys have any questions in the audience? We have some topics we can talk about also. Go ahead, Marshall. What's the next topic you think? So I, I think we, the, one of the things that I really want to get across is, uh, is the, the idea of learning, right? So, uh, you guys are here, you know, Victoria right here in the front, she was in my class yesterday. Uh, and I think it's really important that uh, we're always looking for answers and looking for opportunity. And I think sometimes in this industry, uh, we tend to be focusing with our head down and getting orders out and not necessarily trying to learn new things, learning a new technique or learn uh, something about your customer or learning and networking and how other people are doing stuff or how they're doing marketing or making a video or writing a blog or filming a video or whatever they're doing. You know, and so it's really important that we take an opportunity every now and again to just get out there and learn something. And I think coming to a trade show is a big part of that. So I applaud everybody that's here and yeah. all the all the the people who are actually at the show when it uh, kicks off here in about a half an hour. You know, so that's that's really great. Um, but you don't necessarily have to come to a trade show for that. Right. So you can do a lot with. Um, reading a book or watching a video series or whatever, right? So it's really important that you just take that time to get out there and do that, right? So, um, and- It doesn't have to be books or stuff on this industry. You know, we were talking about that last night. It was with a guy, Marshall, who was new to the industry. He's been six months working, learned how to screen print uh, for this company. And, you know, the owner of the company told us he's doing great. And he comes from the food industry, he managed restaurants and stuff. And he made the click this week. Uh, he was at, uh, I think, Charlie Tigerleaf's class. In this room. In, in this room, right behind. You can see his equipment. There. <laughs> but, um, you know, he goes, he's telling me, he goes, Alan, he goes, you know, coming from managing pizza shops that they're talking about in screen printing, how, you know, he runs an automatic and stuff and he knows how to do it, but not sure the whys of that. The screen is the most important part. I go, yeah, it's called screen printing. And, you know, I always say to you, listen, you've heard me say it, that press, that dryer, no matter how big, how much it is and everything and how cool it looks on I mean, it, it doesn't work without that screen. And if the screen sucks, everything else is going to suck in your print department. You're going to have band-aids on it. Yeah. And he was making the thing where... Uh, Our pizza that if the dough is lousy, doesn't care how much sauce, what kind of topping stuff put on it, it's going to be a pad pot. And I thought that was incredible. And then we got talking, I know... Our friend Richard Greaves uh, has always recommended, he made that correlation between food, chefs, cooking, and screen printing on there of preparation of how things move. And then Drew was actually talking about how the end user to the customer, how that affects in food service. So I thought it was great. We were talking about Anthony Bourdain's book, Media Raw. So yeah. So I think that was a, a, a great thing. I, we said great into it. Right. So it was, I, it was just awesome. I, that's how a, do you guys cool. learn? What's what's your favorite way of finding out something new? Try, huh? Try just try trial and error. Well, that's part of learning too. Yeah, you have to be open to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. I try to watch YouTube or videos like the training programs, like the the tribe, the pretty much what the videos and tribe are, what people are doing, see right. what you can take. Mm -hmm. And I watch YouTube videos in different languages. Like, right. for example, for DTF, I can't understand what they're saying. Right. You're not that's fluent in Mandarin? That's how I installed my entire printer. Yeah, yeah. I, can't, I yeah. can't understand anything. So, But I'm watching movements, where their hands are, yeah. to learn something that I knew nothing about. Yeah. Large, wide format. Yeah. So if you're, you're, you're watching the video, so Davis was saying that uh, he uses videos to help him learn. And even if it's another language, he can discern some information that's going to help him learn how to operate his new... Uh, DTF printers that all come from China. So, uh, you know. Social media is a big thing. So I um, tend to join a lot of social media groups. So if it's um, 
So when I wanted to get into DTF, I just basically uh, looked up different ETF, different high school ETF groups and yeah. found different groups. And <clears throat> something about Facebook, when you say something, you just start getting all these pop-ups that right. is similar to what you just said. So if you say DTF, all of a sudden you start seeing ads and everything right. start coming to your phone. So, so yeah, so it's like, I didn't even have to type. I just talked about it. Somebody, but then, yeah. All of a sudden, all this stuff started coming to my phone. And then that's how I, I met the company where I got my machine from. Right. And just from talking and my phone heard it. So. Right. So, Victoria, if you're watching, Victoria was saying, in case the microphone didn't pick it up, uh, she was saying she likes to use Facebook groups or other social media groups. And uh, whatever she's interested in, it seems to pop up on her phone. And that's how she discovers yeah. new information. So that's kind of interesting. I, I would say be leery of Facebook groups. There's equally amount of bad information as there is good information mm. on the very wide open ones where anyone that has may have the dinkiest little printer is telling you how to run your big wide format printer. Right. And they're trying to give you your advice on that. So be very cautious of, of who you're taking your advice from in those types of groups in, our, in the DTF world. I always say every everybody's an expert behind the keyboard. Yeah, exactly. Everybody. And exactly. So it might not be true. So so we got some comments here. So uh, Ron says Richard Greaves talks about making a cake when talking about emulsion. Absolutely. And uh, Frank says, are there a lot of DTF guys at the show like Long Beach? I would say no. So I Long Beach, one. it seems like you couldn't throw a rock without hitting a DTF uh, printer. <laughs> And here, there's we've kind of what yesterday. Three? I saw one. there's two. There's two. two. One with powderless, one with powderless. Right. I, I, I the powder there's powderless. The powderless one is oh, Overflex. Yeah. Who are the other two that are here? Uh, American Print Supply. That's one. McLeod. And McLeod's here. Cobra, okay. Cobra yeah. has the Cobra has the other. Yeah, one. it's Cobra Flex. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then uh, Dan says, fail has way too many negative or connotations. Try and fail and you get closer to success each time. Absolutely. And then Ron has one of my favorite quotes, which is trust but verify. Which is what I was going to say on Facebook groups. But yeah, absolutely. Um, Listen to them, but verify. So one of my favorite stories about failure is uh, WD-40. Who has a can of WD-40 in their house or toolbox, right? You know, they tried and failed 39 times before they invented WD-40. All they did was name each successful, I mean, unsuccessful thing. And then finally they made it work. And that was the 40th one, right? So what if they had stopped at 18, right? They went all the way through to 40. So just like... Think about the stuff that you guys are doing and trying and working on, right? And what number is that? I should put my number in something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. Hey, Jesse Martinez with Matsui is watching. Good morning, hey, Jesse. Jess, how you doing? So uh, anybody else have some questions? Come up and uh, introduce yourself. We got an open mic here. Come on, don't be shy. You got a question. I know you do. I got a question. Come on up here. Okay, I don't think the mic's picking you up. Uh, okay. I'll try. Introduce yourself. Where are you from? Yeah. <laughs> there have to be many right. <laughs> Okay, my name is Mehmet. I'm from Atlanta. Um, my shop name is Tidal Colors. Okay. And we have DTF. I have a very technical question. I don't know if it's good if you can't answer it. The answer we'll make it up. seven. Okay, good. I, I thought <laughs> that's right. All right, so we are having difficulties printing artworks that has shadows. Like a and drop shadow underneath yes, the figure? Yes, like something um, has opacity less than 100. Like yeah. 50. Well, like the gradient into the shirt. Yeah, the powder sticks and when you peel it off, it looks terrible. Okay. So we can't do anything that has shadows or less opacity, which DTG can do. Yeah. So, uh, like, you know, like they're, they're handing out the All American Supply, handing out t shirts. The Captain America okay. has like a sunlight coming back of them, it just fades away. 
you can't do that. I can't do that on DTF. Right. The, the, the sunlight just fades away. Right. It, it, it starts to look terrible after a while. Okay. So uh, Davis, I don't right? know the answer to that. Davis, you got the solution? Yeah, we do. All right. Come up to the microphone, Davis, and give us the solution. Davis, but Matt Davis is the DTF master, by the so, way. And Marsh Wheel was like, we don't know everything, but we know people who know stuff. All right. <laughs> we just know a lot of people. So in regards to your question, that is a yes slash no. You can't get the same exact fade that you can get with a DPG machine right. to the garment, but there is a Photoshop add-on called Raster Me. Raster Me. Raster Me will pixelate your your faded image removes pieces of it with the background and let it, that fade look much better. Um, I have a picture of one we've done. It's still not 100% a DTG fade, okay. but it's absolutely sellable in our world and it'll solve your That's issue. what I need because it looks terrible otherwise. Yeah, it looks, it's right. it looks like a box or a bad fade. Yeah, yeah. yeah I saw you talking to me as you were talking. Davis was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know exactly <laughs> had, what I'm that one, figure that yeah. one out. Um, and then I can, uh, I believe it's Raster Me, but I can check with somebody in my office to confirm the it's software. It's Raster Me, right? Yeah, it's a Photoshop add-on. And okay. it's a, you can remove uh, blacks, like, or I'm sorry, I'm saying, say it's on a black t-shirt, you can remove the black automatically so the shirt comes through. Mm -hmm. And you can do the dots and the size of the dots, too. So, so it's you, like bit napping you, the halftone of Photoshop? Correct. Okay. Exactly. But it's doing it with a couple of uh, action buttons and much less labor. Okay. So. Thank you very much. Okay, so I got an answer here online. So uh, David Egger says, for the DTF shadowing, go talk to Cobra Flex. It is possible with the Cobra Flex because it's powderless. Two. So there you go. So uh, there's a booth down on the floor. Go yeah. talk to those guys and see Chris or Jim. Or Brad. Or Brad. Uh, Hurley had a question. Or a statement up there. Oh, I missed that. Yep. Uh, and Dan uh, Solomon did too above that. Turn your failures into fuel to keep driving forward. Yep. And Dan Chim Dan, Chim Dan says, uh, would WD-40 make a darn aerosol that can last through the winter, please? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll bring that concern to them. They listen to Marshall now. Yeah, yeah. Does Corel Draw and Flexi have that same option? I don't know. Um, Flexi's the, the the rip software is irrelevant. It needs to be done in the photo software. So that raster me is not available for Corel. That's why we have Photoshop for yeah. that point. The when it gets into the the tiling software, that doesn't matter which software you have. Right. We have th three different ones, and it can it can it does the same thing. It's all about the image that goes into it. Okay. So does cool. that plugin work with Affinity, or is it only Photoshop? This one is only uh, Photoshop. I'm sure they're not far behind on Affinity. Uh, yeah. if anybody watching is not familiar with Affinity, uh, Marshall tipped me off to it about eight months ago, and it has taken about half of our. Uh, yeah, it's really uh, great. It's really uh, designing we do for our so if, uh, yeah. DTF. Affinity is spelled A-F-F-I-N-I-T-Y and uh, instead of paying Adobe monthly, you pay 50 bucks and you're done forever. And uh, it, they, have a, they have a raster uh, photo, uh, Affinity photo, it's just like Photoshop and then Affinity uh, designer is just like Illustrator. It opens all those files and does all that stuff. And it's got a, it's very quick, super easy to use, has a lot of really great effects and things. You just click and all of a sudden you get this really cool image and you didn't really do anything. Right? So, you said Affinity can be used with Raster. I don't know about Raster. We use it on Photoshop. Right. Oh, okay. um, but Creative Market or Envato yeah. have a lot of cool, unique things for Affinity that put metal effects with a couple clicks of a button. Stuff that you can do with the DTF that I wouldn't know how to draw. I'm not a very good artist. Let's, I'll just be honest. I can come up with great ideas, but I can't draw them. Yeah. And we can do some really, really cool stuff. Yeah. So Davis was talking, uh, in case you couldn't hear him, he was talking about how Affinity, you can find uh, some uh, uh, files and templates you can use on uh, Envato Elements or Envato Market, Creative Market. These are all places that are like stock photo things that you can I have a subscription to Envato Elements. That's what I use. 
and you can find a lot of uh, interesting things there. So, um, so Jesse says being able to print half tones is also a possible option. And David says graphics is now set up for DTF channeling. It could be a graphic source. Yeah. So thanks, guys. Where are we on time? We got about 15 minutes ish. So. Um, What's that? You've been talking that long? Oh, yeah. It goes fast. Yeah. Come on back up, man. Yes, <laughs> Do it. Right. See, it's not that scary, is it? No, it's not scary. I was just, yeah, you're just being just, broadcast over just the whole entire planet. That's why I, I do want to. You want me to tell you how many people are watching live? No, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, I'm also curious if you guys or anyone else is using um, any registering software or something um, to be able to cut the DTF roll in a plotter. In a plotter? Yes. Uh, I don't know about that. Um, that's interesting. So if anybody's watching right now, if you have the answer to that, chime in. Okay, so you're trying to get it, you're printing everything out, and what you want is somebody that cuts all this stuff up. Yeah, technically, um, I've been told that um, there's a plugin on Illustrator for GraphTech that can register the designs. And then, but we're not using Illustrator for the DTF, we're using Photoshop. Somehow I need to transfer that file to Photoshop to give the white ink thing. to do the ability for print cut. Right. Yes, instead then, of just you with some scissors. Yeah, we use yeah. scissors, but yeah. you know, literally one person is full time doing scissors on us. Right. right. So if I can use the graph deck, because we print art art in, in parts. Yeah. So we can just feed it, you know, right. and then that person can just take over the printers. Yeah. Right. How do you guys do it, Davis? You got a thing? We are. You want to come up front, teach the class? <laughs> I know. Um, I think we're going to have to have Davis on the show. <laughs> I, mean, actually, I think we're going to have to as a special guest coming up. So, so currently, uh, throw your scissors away. Go buy a 36-inch, uh, uh, what's the tape? What's the rotary, rotary uh, cutting blade? It, you what, slide blade? Uh, rotary. 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 Yeah. So pretty much you'll put a roll hanger on the end. Roll them through, just slide back and forth. It'll save the hands a lot and be much faster. But the designs are just really all around. Okay, so we tile ours, and we don't try to absolutely maximize okay. the space. We we don't cut in in depth that much because when I give my production a perfect square, it's much faster to line up. Mm. So they're not trying to figure out if the image is this way or this way. They have their square. So I'm losing a little bit on material and film, but I'm gaining that back up on speed of cutting and speed of pressing. Interesting. Oh, so good point. I haven't thought about that on the ease of yeah, setup and production on it. Yeah. So that's the easy, that's the quick way. The graph tech uh, comment is absolutely doable. I've seen it done in videos from overseas. There is, uh, it's, it's all related to which type of cutter you have and what type of market needs to be in. That would need to be added to the design in Photoshop. And from my understanding, there needs to be a vector cut line that that can read, like, like any plotter would for cutting a name or number out. There needs to be some type of outline, yes. like big circle vectors that you would plot and then you send that PLT file and they should be able to match up. We have not figured that out completely yet. We do a lot of one-offs with all different artwork. And then we also do a bunch of a hundred of the same. We're gonna test it with the hundred of the same first. And so it's not having to jump everywhere, but that's that's our theory on that. So a lot, when we get the orders in, you know, we do print on demand. So every single order is different for our customers. We don't do bulk orders yet but we print like almost thousand t-shirts a day and every single one of them is different. So we got team working on t-shirts and orders one by one, you know, the youth small has a different size and X large is a different size of the artwork. That's why we're trying to maximize the film, but I'm gonna literally give it a try what you said on the rotary blade. But 
what we do is we give it a part like five meters long templates. We put everything in. That's what I call the parts. Okay. Is that the best way to do or? Uh, can right. you repeat what he said? So people can <laughs> yes. Hear? So what he's saying is they, they're, they're an on-demand printing shop and they, he labeled his by five meters at a time, which is 15 feet. Um, and in that 15 feet, they put as many designs in as they can for uh, for that production run. Yes, correct? we we do our similar. We're an on demand. That's how we run our web stores. We do we break them down into groups of 30. 30 let, let everybody know how many web stores you have. Currently, there's about 420 online stores oh um, running every day. And then the, the comment by Ali, <laughs> she was beating me up last night. She said, how many are active right now? Uh, in seasonal, about 100, 110, about a quarter of them are processing the orders at the moment. They're all with, seasonal. At which Ali said, too, that's kind of common, the numbers she found, no matter how many Webster's, it's always about that. Yeah. About 25% at one time. So, um, the where were we at on the question, though? The, you, were, you were doing a 30 at a time. Yeah, yeah. so you, you're doing, we're doing 30 at a time, which is awfully similar to 15 uh, – 15 meters so we're, we're right in the same ball any more files it's almost too much for the computer to handle yes. uh the the ram and the memory can't hold much more even if we have like 128 rams on the computer but yeah so we have 30 prints and we have 30 shirts the prints get stacked in the same order the shirts get stacked in yes. the same order and then we blow them out and then they get put back together at the end yes so we don't mm -hmm. have the cutter um but we have them broken down into jobs like you have parts so we're running it awfully similar. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much. Sounds like you're close. Just a couple of tweaks will help you out. So. Yeah, the, the, the border will let you out. So right. uh, Josh Wiley in Oklahoma says, love hearing this. So hard to explain on cutting. Yeah. So you're helping some folks here, David. <laughs> yeah. So you know. So thank you. That's uh, what happens when you just push them all in. That's <laughs> what we're doing. You learn fast. Yeah. So I was teasing Davis last night at dinner because I remember in the day I dealt with his dad when they were all screen printing it. He was telling everybody what he does. He goes, yeah, I don't screen it, print it. We, we just got rid of all screen printing. He goes, sorry, Alan. I just go, miss your dad so much. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. So uh, any more questions? Both from online folks and from you guys here. We'd love to help you guys out. Victoria, about? I know you got another one. Oh, yeah, yeah. We got She's about got eight, 10, 12 minutes. Okay, cool. We got plenty of time. All kinds of time. We'll so, go over. Hello, I'm Victoria from Beeline's Techmatic um, in Maryland. So uh, my other question is, what's a good profit margin? So for instance, well, if how much do you want to make? Um, it's unlimited. Okay, so <laughs> if, if I'm outsourcing, so I remember you said in your class that when you're outsourcing, there are two types of plans that you have to have. So I'm, I'm more of a control person, where so I like to be in control um, right. because I had a bad experience of outsourcing and I did a horrible job, so I had to redo everything all over. Yeah. So if you're outsourcing, what's a good uh, profit margin? Well, I'd say a lot of the a lot of the companies that I talk with, you know, they're uh, if they're contract right contract folks. They tend to be, uh, if they can get in the 20s, they're lucky, I think. And uh, if you're full-blown retail, most of them are somewhere in the 40s. Just depends on where you are, right? So, you know, what, what's your experience, Davis, or anybody else here? Right? I would say if you're testing out contractors, ask how their processes are. Don't ask how their prints are. Ask how you approve the order, how you pay for the order, how long it takes for that to happen. Mm -hmm. If you find the one with the best process, you, I can guarantee you their prints are going to be more than acceptable or better than what you could screen print. Uh, it's all about the, do they have the technology? Is it any of their system automated so that you're not waiting on someone to send it to you? Um, and that's the best shops we found that we work with all have and then you're just processes. and then you're just whatever they're quoting you you're marking that up mm -hmm. right to make the profit margin that you want correct right and so that's so like you have to dial in where you want to be with that 
right? And uh, I think every company is going to have a different answer to that. Um, and it just really depends on your market you're serving, you know? So uh, the way I, I've explained it before, I mean, you're catering to Mercedes-Benz owners or 14-year-old used Chevy owners, right? What, what, how big is that pocketbook of your client, right? Because there's some people who've got, they don't care what the price is, they'll buy it, right? And there's other people who are penny-pinching people, right? So where are you on that spectrum for your pricing depends on your clients more than anything. On the side note, we, uh, we actually take our, two of our screen print contractors and we have their price lists recalculated up with our markup in it. That's how we, we know we're selling. When they update their prices, we update ours. And Perfect. we know what our margin is every time up front that we use a computer software to create that. But it's all it's all front loaded. So we know we're hitting our margins before we even get yeah. So a comment here from Frank is retail is 35 to 40 percent, contract is 15 to 20, which is Kind of what I said. So thanks, Frank, for agreeing with you. Yeah. <laughs> I think, too, what Davis said, in case you couldn't hear that, he said that he actually takes when his contract screen printing, the people that screen print for him now, um, he, he has their price list, but it's marked up uh, on his site. So they always know where they're making profit. As they adjust it, he adjusts it. So that's great. But I also think, too, in your market, while I've been, we've been talking that you went all in with DTF, you also know a market is a market. And it's not 100% for everybody. You still have that where you're not going to walk away from a sale. You're still going to uh, be the solution guy and still handle that customer. Yeah, so that was important. You can't print 250 DTF transfers for $7.50. Yeah, exactly. And press the shirts. Yeah. You can still screen print it. Somebody can do it for you, but yeah. you can't do it with a heat press. Yeah. Well, and also, like you said, on checking on a contractor, ask them about their process, not their prints. And I got laughing in my own head because I'm thinking, so how are your prints? Well, they're lousy. Nobody's ever going to say that. You know, find out the process. Good processes, you're going to have good printers. Mm -hmm. So that, that was good. And I also, I want to say, if you're talking with contractors to help you, right, one of the things that really gets overlooked is what happens if there's a problem, okay? So they're late on their order, or they goof it up, or are they uh, – forget to print the back of the shirt or whatever stuff always happens, right? How are they going to rectify that situation? Right. You need to know that before you send them a bunch of stuff. Right. And, uh, cause I know, uh, I was just talking with a, uh, a guy yesterday, actually, he called, uh, we, he was very concerned about one of his people. He was contrasting some stuff to, Goofed up a big order, cost him about eighteen thousand dollars, and uh, he had to make it right with his client. Well, the, the the guy who printed the shirts didn't really help with that. So it's like you know, uh, your customer doesn't know that you sent the thing out. <laughs> so you have to find out what's going to happen if they do something wrong. They print it crooked. It's the wrong color. You know. Because you're not there <laughs> when they ran the job, right? So how are they going to fix it? What are they going to do? Do they stand behind their work, right? That's super important. Um, get it in writing. Don't just take their word over on the phone. Have some sort of agreement. How do you pay them? What do you? What happens if something's wrong? Um, so they they should stand behind their work. And there's tons of really great contract people out there that will handle stuff for you. One side note, if you pay them when you place the order, they're more likely to get your job done out on time. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Didn't I say that yesterday? Yeah, you said the yes, exact same yeah. word. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in my class, someone stole it from someone. <laughs> so in my class yesterday, I made the comment that if you're contracting stuff, if you pay people when you place the order or really quickly within 10 days, you tend to be at the top of their production schedule rather than if you're that net 30 guy or whatever that you never pay you're never getting your stuff out. So, um, give some comments, some good ones. Too. Okay, great. So, where are we? Well, uh, good one. So, Ron yeah. says, send the penny pictures to your competition. Absolutely. Right. So, your worst customers, you got a place that they can go. Right? I just don't think I can help you here. I know a guy. Here we go. Yeah. Send them there. Send them to your competition. Uh, 
DTF user wish list. What kind of products that are not available, which can help DTF users? Obviously, a way to cut these things out quicker. Because <laughs> we just talked about that. What do you? What other things would you guys like to see? Uh, you got two DTF guys right here. Where would you like me to start? <laughs> Davis has a list. That might be a whole other. I actually think we should have Davis on. <laughs> DTF Expo, you know. On, on, on there. Are you having problems with the media or the ink or uh, the adhesive or there? Yeah. <laughs> so thanks for remembering the microphone. With DTF, there are a few common instances. There is always issues, not always, but there's very commonly an issue with some part of the film in every roll where it's not a hundred percent consistency. It's, co it's not coated, it fell off something. And so there and is you a- You mean from the media itself? From the media itself, no ink, no nothing involved. No what, what yeah, no ink receptive printing. on it. No. Um, then you can also have a bad whiting, which can ruin everything. You can have bad mixtures of color. Humidity is a major factor in the room and temperature. So yep. the room needs what to do be... you What do you want to keep at? You have a hygrometer in your room with you? 40 to 60. 40 to 60. Yeah, and that's year round. So in Pennsylvania in the winter, it's a little hard to keep it at 40. We have extra humidifiers running everywhere. In the right. summer, we have dehumidifiers running everywhere. Yeah. Right. Um, so about three and I think on the year perfect. Yes. Make sure the <laughs> hygrometers are not on an outside wall either. Make sure they're on an inside wall to get a true reading out. Okay. Hey, that's a good tip. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Alan. <laughs> um, there are issues with streaking in the inks when printing because they're not wearing clothes <laughs> close to it <laughs> before the clothes are put on the if there is a large say we're printing this image if the if this image on a shirt and there's a lot of purple here when there's a ton of ink in one spot you will see a banding of sorts kind of like when you would print a banner you kind of see a little back and forth from the printhead, that's not perfect yet either. Um, that's a level of ink first level of white mixture combination that's all in the computer and it's not a quick fix. It's a right. it's a trial you and get, error. You got to play with it a little bit. Yes. Okay. So when so you're big trying solid to, colors. when you're big solid colors are hard. A yellow smiley face, force yeah. gum smiley face. It's difficult to run. Have a nice day, not very nice. Exactly. Things along that nature are not where you could screen print them and they'd look great. They're not going to look as good DTF. Yeah. So those are some of the. Um, so if you know that going in, do you design differently? And so you have a different choice for your outcome? You can attempt to design differently, which that is in most cases, tell the designers to stay away from thick colors. Yeah. Obviously, you know, that's not always the case when the customer walks in and Wants a big smile. Face. They want a big smile. Right. Face. Do you have that also with black or not? Uh, we don't have any issues with black. Gray, uh, grays are difficult. They look bluish or purplish. Yep. And they're one day they can look gray, and then three hours later they can look. Try to go on a smile. silver color code. It's more grayish. Okay. Oh, nice. There's a side tip: silver color code. What Steve yeah. said. Um, but. Other than that, it's slow when tiling multiple designs. I don't have an answer for you for that, but we will shortly. <laughs> uh, we're working on that. And uh, there's no automation for DTF like there is in the screen printing world yet. Um, well, I know you've been looking at Cantera. Caldera. Cal Caldera? Caldera. Right, to help uh, nest the images. Correct. Right? Because uh, that comes from the sign industry, right? Yes. Okay. And in regards to that, uh, we are not getting the information we need from our online store platform easily. So that's what we're yeah. working out the kinks of how to use the XML files to automate. Like he would print his uh, business, business cards and things. We're trying to run our garment printer that way. Right. Hmm. Right. Right. Cool. Do you have any issues on the um, powder sticking outside of the design? like the film so when you print it on the, on the garment yeah like little sparkles are around stain so that means there's too much moisture in your area in your, in your powder casing area and that could be of any any heat or whatever elements and the silica packs yeah. 
we have our entire thing lined with the silica bags you can buy on Amazon, and it solved our issue. What do you mean? Like the things you find in shoes to keep them dry? Or, or, or you buy a jacket and something, there's a little so bag or pouch in there that's to keep moisture out of there. Oh, okay. It's called silicone. Yeah, it says so, yeah. do not eat on it. They yeah, make bigger ones. They're like Tide Pods. Um, Don't eat them. We found the issue actually to be on the film itself, but we changed the film or replace it, same humidity, it, it's just gone. Okay, so that could be a bad film situation yeah. too. Yeah. Uh, we've been through plenty of film vendors. Yeah, and also the what, whatever it's called, the agitator or something. Needs to run really fast. The agitator speed will, it doesn't necessarily need to be super fast, but it does, uh, you you can keep playing with it till you find that perfect round. Literally, you can run your own logo and say, okay, I have it on this speed. Can it be off? Can I speed it up a little bit and yeah. get it all off? Where's the slowest I can get it and get all the all the powder off? That's, right. what, that's just a trial and error. Yeah. So I have a question here. Uh, so how many DTFs is Davis running and how often are they down or being worked on? I'm just wondering how efficient they are. And that comes from Frank from SNS. Oh, Frank, I'm sorry. What did I say? I don't know. You just didn't say it all. <laughs> Frank, we have two running full time. Uh, we just purchased our third and it is actually, uh, uh, it was not in 100% working condition when we bought it, but we're working on bringing that up. So we'll have three printers running. On average, they run six to seven hours a day. Uh, we find that the, when they're not running, it's because we don't have enough artwork tiled and ready to put into them. Um, so it's our pre-product. So it's your organization more than it is with the, something wrong with the printer. It's the labor of getting the stuff ready to print that with okay. the one person. We don't have enough space to keep the two running. That's where I'm looking at the automation software. Right. Um, but they would they this time of year they could be running eight hours a day and once they start running they don't have to stop that's that's the goal. Um, yeah, that's so, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I have a question. So, like, I do a lot of transfers, like selling transfers, but I keep them um, local so so they can like easily come and pick up. Mm -hmm. So, if you were mailing out the transfer, what suggestions would you have? I know the silicone packs. I've, I've done the silicone packs. Um, the smaller ones, I didn't know they came bigger, um, and put them in the packaging. But should you put a, a clear transfer sheet or something over it um, as your packaging, or just leave them like they come out the film and and, and just um, you can just stack them and then put them in the, the whatever you're mailing it, send it off. How would you? You're say you're mailing your transfers out. Yes, I've mailed I've mailed a couple of them out. Oh. Shops that want to keep press on themselves, they keep them. Oh, I yeah. there. I would I buy a thing couple. from stalls and see how they sell it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> or somebody that's ordered somebody else that's shipping transfers, I'd buy an order from them and see. see I know. That's a uh, good call. Yeah. Yeah. Super color. It's just it comes in plastic bag. Yeah, there's nothing. Yeah. yeah. Super yeah. color is a little different though. Yeah, they have yeah. different type of DTF. I don't know. It's not it DTF. It's a it's a, it's a screen based. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a digital yeah, screen. It's not what we have. It's I know what it is, and I'm not allowed. I'm under NDA. It's impressive. I'm an, I, yeah, I'm under NDA okay. with a couple so, of them. I can't say. Jesse Martinez says Matsu is currently developing DTF ink and consumables. How Best can we provide that, better solutions? This is new to us. Did you know this, Marshall? No. Hey, Q and A breaks it again. Do you well, need a guinea pig? I was just going to say, <laughs> Jess. I think I, you have your beta test site. I get with David. So, so she said they have what they're testing out what? Uh, so Jesse Martinez from Matsui. Matsui is a water-based ink company, but they also make digital inks uh, and uh, color. And so they're working on that DTF ink right now. And so he's, Matsui is a Japanese ink company, but he's with their USA division. Their head technical guy around. He's amazing. Yeah, guy. he lives in Phoenix where I am. Yeah. Oh, if you need a test subject, I'm right here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Davis, I just, you know, maybe it'll help all. Um, we have a we have a team overseas, so once we go sleep, they start working. So they start doing nesting overnight. When we start the shop in the morning, six a.m., everything's ready. Yeah. So that's how. So that's similar that to like a virtual assistant, right? Yeah, but the time difference should be the key, not from. Yeah, like like my I have one that East. she lives in the Philippines, so she she's doing stuff. Yeah, okay. that, well, we have like eight hours difference. Yeah, right. So they start working while we spend the stuff. Yeah. So we work like if, if I work 24 hours a day, which I don't, yeah. plus eight hours that, that adds so, to my shop. So nobody does investing here. Marshall, so, your dad just walked in. 
<laughs> so Davis, so uh, Jesse says yes. Yeah. So Jesse, I'll send you his info in case you don't have it. Right. So why don't we go ahead and wrap up? This was good. So uh, hey, that wasn't you. Marshall's dad. Charlie Tyler just walked in. Charlie, wave to the camera. So right there. So, so uh, anyway, so thank you uh, for joining us here live and also joining us uh, out on the internet world. So we appreciate that. And uh, we'll see you next week, right? Ready. At our yeah. normal time, 12 noon Eastern. Eastern. So it's going to be on the short lap tribe. Nope. No. This is on, uh, I'll let you know after we end the show. Okay. So, um, all right. Well, hey, well, thank you everyone for watching and we'll, uh, we'll catch you next week. Thanks. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you very much. Yes.